Okie dokie. So first slide. Yes. Thank you. Wait, could you, could you go back one? So I'm going to uh, talk about this um, because it's the, the thing that I've been doing most recently uh, at Airbnb. But what I want to do um, before I delve into how Airbnb became purpose and values driven, I want to have a quick romp through um, all the communities I've worked in over the past 10, 15 years because I kind of brought a lot of that learning and knowledge um, to what I did at Airbnb. So this was my whole journey started in community uh, when I did the thinking behind this book called The Culting of Brands. And how this happened was um, I used to work in an ad, ad agency in New York, and we had clients come in one day, and they were depressed. They said, this was like uh, 20 years ago. <clears throat> they said, branding is over, marketing is dead, all products are the same, easily replicable, there's no point of difference anymore, um, I won't have a job in a few years' time. So pretty depressed. I'm not going to tell you who they were. Quite a famous brand, actually. Um, then, as it happened, that night, I went to a focus group in Midtown Manhattan and uh, watched a bunch of teenagers talk about their favorite brand of sneaker, which happened to be Converse. And they were talking in almost religious terms, evangelical terms, about what, at the end of the day, are bits of rubber and plastic. Uh, just the same, functionally, as any other sneaker. But you couldn't tell them that. They were absolutely committed to these bits of rubber and plastic. So, so obviously, the marketers are wrong. You can create enormous, passionate commitment, even to, in a commodity market. But I wanted to find out why. And given that they were talking in almost religious terms, I thought maybe I should take a look at cult brands like Apple and Harley and figure out how they do what they do. And then I thought, well, why stop there? Why not look at the original? Why not look at cults, the most extreme form of belonging and belief and of commitment, and try and deconstruct how they do what they do so that we could take that learning and apply it to brands? And so over the next couple of years, I did hundreds and hundreds of interviews of members and ex-members of full-on cults like Krishna, then other cult-like organizations all the way down to brands, so like um, cults that then became a religion, like all religions started as cults, like uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, the Marines, Trekkies, sports teams, and then cult brands. And I was interviewing people, these members, to find out not just what those organizations did, but why they became so committed. And, that, and, and the goal here was to, to kind of um, decode what it takes to create intense belonging and belief and commitment to anything. And the good thing that I learned very quickly, otherwise it would have been a total waste of time, is that the kind of people who join cults, contrary to popular belief, are like most of the people in this room. Um, they're normal, and they join for very normal reasons, actually the same reasons that we all join anything, a company, a church, or whatever. So it was, it was good, that was good. Otherwise, whatever I was learning from cults wasn't applicable to, um, to brands. Um, so anyway, this is where I started. And at the time, though, I was a little bit of a lone voice in the world. This was 2004 it was published. So no social networks had launched. No Facebook, no Flickr, no Twitter, nothing. And so I was a bit of a lone voice in the wilderness saying that the next big thing in, in, in business is going to be community. But um, there's two things uh, that made writing this book worthwhile. The first one was that Chris told me um, a few weeks ago uh, that uh, he had read this book, and it was an inspiration for this. And, and maybe others have written books, and it's easy for them, but I found it really hard, hated it. You know, as I was writing, I was going, this is shit, this is shit. Um, and I, you know, I just wanted the thing to be finished and over and done with. I didn't really care if anyone read it in the end. But knowing that... Um, that Chris read it and it kind of led to something like this was, uh, was made it all worthwhile. And the other thing that did also is that some of the people that were making those new social networks like Flickr and, and others uh, read the book. So they told me afterwards. And uh, two of those people, uh, two Canadians actually, uh, Katerina Fake and Stuart Butterfield, told the founder of Meetup oops, um, that the, he should read the book because it's all about Meetup without being about Meetup. And um, I ended up being a, a partner with the, the founder there. So what was great about going to Meetup is that Meetup is about ordinary, everyday people performing ordinary, everyday communities, about anything, learning to speak Spanish, going for a hike, parenting, whatever. This one happens to be about stoned yoga. 
There's a surprising number of these, actually. This one's in San Francisco, but you know, it could be here, it could be in Portland. Um, so it's great to like, dip like a tea bag into the lives, ordinary lives of people who are forming ordinary communities every day. And I learned a ton, amount of, a ton of stuff. But when I was at Meetup, I then, this was 2007, 2008, Obama was running for president using all kinds of interesting techniques, movement making techniques. And I was looking at that and, and became as interested in movement making as I had been about cults. Why? Because in movements, large numbers of people, millions, will take the same action at the same time against a leverageable point, a politician or a country or, or a, a leader or a company, to make a huge change, often big social change. And I wanted to know how that was done and see if we could apply it in other fields. So as it happened, I met a, a friend, a now a really close friend called Jeremy, who also joined Meetup, Jeremy Hymans. He just published a book last year called New Power, um, which is all about that, actually. I highly recommend it, New Power. Um, <clears throat> and we started a company called Purpose. We left uh, Meetup, started Purpose. And um, what we did was, uh, and Jeremy, by the way, had started successful movements already all around the world. He knew loads about it. So um, we started this consultancy that advised organizations, mostly nonprofits, but some brands like uh, Nike, uh, Dove, and others, on how to create movements for change at a mass, mass level using digital and offline tools. But the other thing we did is, one of the reasons we started this company is we wanted to launch our own movements about things that we were passionate about. Jeremy and I uh, uh, were gay, are gay. And so we launched this movement called All Out, which is, now is the world's largest LGBT plus movement in the world. And we started with 2,000 members. Within less than a year, we got to over 2.5 million. And what All Out does <coughs> is um, wherever it sees uh, a lack of equality, it dives in and helps make a change, mobilizing millions to take action. So for example, we've run like 30, 40 campaigns. We stopped the Uganda kills, Kill the Gays bill twice. Um, we led the marriage equality in France, uh, which happened a few years ago. Um, the whole narrative in the Sochi Olympics about Russia being homophobic was started by us uh, around that whole um, event, and many, 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 many more. And through this whole experience, I learned uh, a lot of valuable stuff about not just creating intense belonging and commitment, but how you can get a sense of gathering a group of people at a mass scale, globally, in the millions, who identify with each other and the cause and the purpose, and actually take action. So at this point, I was very interested about communities that made a difference, that took action to make big differences, as, as, as we did. So, uh, about this time, I joined uh, Airbnb. And one of the things we realized very early on in Airbnb is that the hotels wanted to kill us. <laughs> basically. Uh, this was about 20, 2012. And we were getting uh, a huge amount of grief from the hotels who had tons of money. Hotel lobby was huge. They had relationships with the cities and local authorities that we didn't have. We just hired one government relations guy. We had one lawyer. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't compete. And, and what we had done, what we were doing basically is Airbnb helped together with Uber and others, created a new economy that bumped up against old laws that didn't recognize this new economy. It didn't recognize hosts and drivers that you could be both a business and a person at the same time. So loads and loads of laws had to be changed. So the one thing the hotels didn't have, they had the money and the lobbying history and the relationships, they didn't have passionate users. They didn't have people power. So I used a lot of what I learned in the whole movement making area and uh, then hired some of, the, some of Obama's grassroots organizing uh, team from the 2008-2012 campaign, because they wrote the, the playbook on this. And we mobilized our hosts to take political action to change laws, initially in San Francisco, Barcelona, and uh, LA, and now it's rolled out to hundreds of cities globally. So the people you're seeing, this is in San Francisco. Um, he is a, an Obama 
uh, grassroots guy, everyone else in there is a, uh, is a host, who have never been social activists before, who've never gone to a government, who've never been to a city hall. But these people were there for that particular day for nine hours until the council turned the lights off, wanting to speak about changing the law, and they were, we were mobilizing them to take political action. So this is what I mean. These movements of grassroots I was really interested in because it gets large numbers of people to take action and to change things. And then the final thing, oh, sorry, this is a picture of, uh, in Barcelona, in the Place Saint-Jean, which is in the Gothic Quarter, where there's the Catalan government on one side and the uh, town hall of Barcelona on the other. And we had 1,100 Airbnb hosts there. Those are the guys with the, with the placards. And we had mobilized the hosts to go out to all of their small businesses that they sent their guests to. You know, they, a lot of Airbnb guests stay in homes which, do not, which have no hotels. And so a lot of cafes and uh, car drivers, everything like this, were getting business they'd never had before. So we got the host to go out with postcards to get the small business owners to sign it and say to the mayor, it's postcards addressed to the mayor, to say, please make uh, Airbnb or home hosting legal. And that's a guy showing up with 3,000 questionnaires. This all took place in a week, uh, delivering them to the town hall and... Uh, and having some trouble with the police, it looks like. So the last thing I got dunked in, and which I'm going to focus on a little bit more, is the last thing I was did, at, first and last thing I did at Airbnb, was helping create a, a community within the company, the community of users, and the brand that was totally purpose and values driven. And I want to talk about this now a bit more, because uh, a lot of people uh, talk about how it's good to be purpose-driven and values-driven, but it's really hard, first of all, to get one, and then secondly, to actually do it. Actually doing it is super hard. There's a handful of companies in the world, I think, that have done it. Um, oh, this is, uh, this is <laughs> we call this one Airbnb. It's the same thing as this. It's um, uh, there was about two, I think in that year, about two and a half thousand Airbnb employees all flown in for one week of the year where um, we basically spend time hanging out with each other and forming relationships and, um, and building a community. So that's what I've been doing over the past 10 or 15 years. And I can draw from that a minimum of five really important commonalities that lead to incredibly powerful communities and sense of belonging. I need some water. Ah. So, um, the first one is purpose-driven. I'm going to talk about that. I think the second one probably leads a bit of explanation. Um, <laughs> so one of the, this, the two most important rules of community making I've learned is every community has to have a very clear purpose, a reason why it exists. Why should someone join? Why should you run it? What, what are you here to do? What are you here to change? The second most important thing is you need to have members that interact with each other to form relationships, form bonds, and create a community. So um, once you hear this, you'll never forget it. It's a little bit vulgar, I know. But you need to rub your members together until they get sticky. <laughs> OK? Rub your members together. I made this a company goal at Airbnb in my first year. Ru uh, uh, sticky members. Rub your members together to make them sticky. And you can do it from the, like, kind of the, the low end of commitment, like online liking things. But the most important way of creating sticky members is this, is face-to-face -face contact where, where, I mean, humans don't, humans learn language and actually, um, and certainly didn't do this till very late in our development. Most of communication is about uh, sort of facial expressions, body language, smell, uh, all those kinds of things. So it's really, really important to have face-to-face -face real contact. The other one is close identification. The fourth one, you kind of have to read the book to know about it, but the right at the heart of, um, of cult belonging is a paradox that most people don't think is true, which is people join cults not to conform, but to become themselves and become more individual. Because they finally find a tribe that's, that's different like they are, but in the same way. And they can relax and feel in a safe space to be the kind of person uh, that they are. Just as uh, Ryan was talking about that maybe this is a kind of community for some of you. And the last thing is a, is, a, is a tool that I helped develop called the Commitment Curve, which uh, helps you program whatever you're doing in your community branding and marketing in a way that will maximize the number of people who take the most actions. 
So I'm doing, I, I wish I had more time to talk about all those things, I don't, but very happy to talk about any of this stuff. I'm doing uh, one of those intense things, what are they called? Inner Sanctums on Friday. Happy to talk about any of that there. So, but what I've, the only thing I've got time to do right now is this first one. Okay. Excuse me. So, purpose, how to get a good one, how to live it. And the second thing is the most important thing, actually. Um, so, <clears throat> that's Brian Chesky, co-founder, CEO of Airbnb. So, uh, I got into Airbnb in a bit of a funny way. I, I think Joe, had, Joe, one of the founders, had read my book. We met for breakfast in New York. He invited me out to do a uh, fireside chat at Airbnb. Um, this is when the headquarters of Airbnb had 150 people. And we have fireside chats, outside experts to come in. And I came in and talked about community. And then, in the middle of all that, they asked me to come back to do a consultancy gig for three or four weeks. This is in 2012. And then in the middle of that, they asked me to stay on full time, which is what I did. But when I flew from New York to San Francisco, uh, saw Brian, he said this, you know a lot about brands, can you help us figure out ours? And I said, huh, uh, I thought I was gonna talk about be there to do community. Um, and I said, let, uh, let me think about that overnight and I'll come back and talk to you tomorrow morning. So I did, and I came back and I said, this, let's figure out what the purpose is instead. I said, clearly there is an incredibly passionate community of people in Airbnb, of, of passionate hosts, passionate guests, and employees who are also passionate hosts and guests. Why? Why are they passionate? What is the role that Airbnb plays in their lives? What is its purpose? What is its why? So if we can figure out what that is, then we can figure everything else out, including the brand. We can figure out, once we've figured out our purpose, our why, we can figure out what products we should launch and which ones we should not. What companies we should buy or merge with and which ones we should stay away from. Who we should hire, who we should fire. What the office should look like. What marketing programs we should do. And what our brand should be. It's basically the rudder that guides the ship. It governs everything. So let's do that first. And, uh, and he said, okay, do that. <laughs> and I went inside, oh shit. God, I've got to do that in three and a half weeks. So, um, okay, so the reason why I was saying all of this, and I'm sure all of you know that having a purpose in an organization is critical, but, uh, but here's just some reminders. Uh, Simon did a very good TED Talk. I think it's like the second or third most watched. Highly recommend it. The book's okay. He just says the same thing over and over again, to be honest. I would watch the TED Talk. Um, I hope he never sees this. Uh, um, so, but he makes a, a, an absolutely right point. Uh, you must always start with why, then the how. The what is the product or the service you're delivering. That's going to change all the time. But the why never changes, and it's, sex, it's the rudder that guides the ship, you know. Then there's this book, which is one of the few business books I've read, actually. Um, and I loved it because it was very well researched and analytical and full of data. And they said visionary companies, ones with have purposes, have done more than just generate long-term financial returns. They have woven themselves into the very fabric of society. These companies have made an indelible imprint on the world around them. And Harvard Business Review uh, published a couple of years ago a really good piece of research where they, this company, this organization spoke to 20,000 employees around the world, all different kinds of companies and industries. And the overall conclusion they came to is why we work determines how well we work. I know you guys know this. It's not the money, it's not the benefits. Those are important. But it's the, main, the main reason you get up in the morning and work really, really hard is the purpose. Purpose, it means in short, and by the way, they have a whole, there's a whole chapter in here called cult-like cultures. Um, it means in short, understanding that cult-like tightness around an ideology actually enables a company to turn people loose to experiment, change, adapt, and above all, to act. So, um, in the last year I was at Airbnb, I was focusing on Airbnb's famous culture, incredibly strong culture, and it was getting a bit wobbly and dodgy. And um, so I went and started talking to a lot of employees about stuff. One of the questions I asked them is, why are you here? You know, by this point, Airbnb was known and quite famous. You could get two or three times your salary elsewhere. And I asked them to write down three reasons why they were here on a piece of card and show it to me. And every single time, apart from one guy out of about 300 people who put money first, uh, wrote this. It's, um, I love the vision. 
I'm very sure that Airbnb's mindset is the right way to go long term. Significant impact, change the world and contribution, worthwhile real mission, then professional growth, fund society, camaraderie, and so on. Camaraderie. Okay, so what is Airbnb's mission? So um, when, we, uh, when we launched our new, I call this our uh, um, Equal Opportunity Genitalia logo, <laughs> because there's something in there for everyone. I mean, everyone. The kind of long tail of desire, it's in there. So uh, when we launched this logo, and by the way, our purpose, that was the first, the first use of the purpose was to brief the design company on coming up with this logo. And what Brian and Joe in particular wanted, uh, two of the three founders, was not a logo, it was a symbol. And a symbol is different from a logo because a symbol is a logo, but with meaning attached. Okay, just like, like the um, maple leaf for Canada, the cross, the dove of peace, whatever it is. It's a, it's a graphic design, but with lots of meaning attached. And so we developed this, um, this we, because of that, we made sure that when we made the new logo, we also launched what the meaning was, which was our purpose. I should just mention, by the way, the reason I put these things up on here, and I was talking about it earlier, is you, in most companies, if a customer or whatever fiddles with the, the logo, armies of lawyers will come down and, and crucify them. Well, we actually designed a tool on the website when we launched the logo to encourage users to fiddle with the logo and make it their own. And so three or 400,000 of our users you created their own version of the genitalia logo, fortunately not too vulgar, and um, it's to make it their own. Anyway, this is the little video we launched which explains what the purpose of Airbnb and its community is. So the purpose of Airbnb is, uh, the short version is belong anywhere, uh, but it's, it's creating a world where anyone can belong anywhere. This actually is painted on the wall of a bedroom uh, of one of our hosts, George. I happened to see this <coughs> just, when, just after we launched uh, Belong Anywhere and the, and the new logo, and I called George up and said, why have you painted what is, to all intents and purposes, a corporate tagline on your bedroom wall? And he said, um, because it feels natural. This is exactly what I try to do, is when strangers who feel, may feel alienated in this new place come into my home, I want them to feel like they're family, that I, they're, they know as much as a local, and feel comfortable and secure to go out into the world, um, which I thought was a nice answer. So this is, by the way, an Airbnb, you might see this, I don't know, but we call this thing our why. Sometimes we call it purpose, sometimes we call it vision, sometimes we call it mission. I don't care what we call it. It's the reason we exist, it's our why. So here we are, Airbnb vision purpose, creating a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Now, where did it come from? Most of these kinds of things come from a bunch of 
expensive executives who are spirited away into one of those god-awful off-sites in a place like this um, to pull stuff out of their asses, look at their navels, and indulge in corporate grandiosity. And they end up with, with uh, what you might expect, which is things which are very predictable and anodyne and, and hopeless. So we didn't do that. We didn't get it from um, uh, the inner sanctum of or you know, the interior of, the, of the, the, the management. We got it from our community. So this is what I did when Brian said, hey, can you, you, know, you okay, you do that. Go and figure out our purpose. I and a small team of, um, of, of people at Airbnb in three and a half weeks went around the world and spoke to 485 hosts and guests and employees in 2012. And what we were looking for, as I said before, was what was the role of Airbnb in their lives? And, and the, we did many things, talked to them about much stuff, but the most important and, uh, technique that we used was, um, was to tell, get them to tell stories of transformation. And the way we did that was I asked them, what were you like before Airbnb? Write down three words on a piece of paper. Now think of yourself now. What are you like now as a person, as an individual? What were you like before? What do you like now? And then we'll go through those three words and those three words, and they'll tell you the story of, of this transformation. So this guy here, for example, Gio in San Francisco, he's a host in the Castro in San Francisco, and he before was a very, he, the words he wrote were things like um, shy, reserved. Now he wrote um, have a purpose, uh, outgoing, uh, empathetic. We found that there was a real difference. Um, this guy up here said, before Airbnb, he was a guest. Before Airbnb, I was a tourist. Now I'm the world's local. I feel like a local wherever I can go. So this is what we, we heard, basically, is that the role of Airbnb, if you like, was to take people, you know when you go on a trip, any trip, probably even to come here, it can be a dehumanizing experience. You leave home, you feel like a stranger in a strange land, you're at the airport, you don't pe know people there, they don't know you, you're not recognized. Um, you get in line to, get on, to check in, you get in line to get on the plane, you get in line to get off the plane, you get in line to get your bags, you get in line to get in the cab. You get in, it's a dehumanizing experience, as some of these people said. Um, the most you are is a number, a seat number, a carousel number, a hotel room number. Um, but with Airbnb, what happens is you come in, and often since the first time since you, came, since you left home, someone calls you by your first name. Say, Sean, how are you? You must be knackered after your 12-hour flight. What do you want? Do you want a cup of tea? Do you want a, a big whiskey? Or shall I just bugger off and come back later when you're all settled in and, and show you around? And it's a real genuine, authentic human contact between uh, one person and another. And the hosts tended to sort of weave guests into the local fabric. They would recommend uh, which restaurants to go to, what buses to take, all those kinds of things basically tool them up and equip them so that they felt they had control in this alien, strange environment. So here's some of the hosts and guests it's talking about that. And it's just, you know, and especially because like, I like to have, I like to have like my tea kettle and I like to be able to like cook things and I like to be able to just kind of feel like I'm just a normal person kind of on a business trip. Yeah, and with Airbnb, it just, it, it kind of reminds me more that I'm just, yeah, I'm just, basically myself while I'm traveling. You always know, depending obviously if you read the listings and you've read the profile, that someone's there to help you if worse comes to worse. And even if it doesn't come, worse comes to worse, they're just, even if you're having a great time, they're there to just enhance your experience that little bit more. When I was in New York, I stayed in East Village and my host there, she was absolutely incredible. And it probably wasn't one of the most um, attractive spaces physically, but in terms of the experience I got from her, she was incredible. I mean, it was like minus five degrees, awful weather. I didn't take any suitable clothing whatsoever. And when I, I was just telling her how cold and horrible it was and emailing her, because it was an entire flat rather than shared thing. And the next day, because she lived locally, she came in and she left me like scarf and this amazing, like really long coat That's and all great. this stuff. And I thought, I didn't even ask. She's so intuitive. Yeah. You're in my house, you're my guest and I'm here to look after you. But you also have to respect each other. It's not just about yeah. me serving you. So when you put that, in very quickly in that conversation, the person feels relaxed. Oh, it's not about just the money. It's not a cheaper alternative to a hotel. This is someone who cares about me and actually is gonna be there to help me. You know, some people, you know, have these little welcome packages. I don't do all that drama. I just think, come in, like, 
put your stuff down, let's have a cup of tea, let's just figure out why you want to come to London. <laughs> some, of the, some of the times the best thing a host can do is just be quiet, you know. Um, so after the event, I went back around the world and asked hosts and guests what they, what they were doing, what they all felt. And they felt they were delivering belong anywhere because it's like you can be at home anywhere in the world. And then this little guy, Isaac, this young guy, Isaac, sweet guy, I asked people to bring an object that represented Airbnb. So he brought this sort of beer bottle thing and a rose. And he said, I'm the rose, the host is the bottle with the water. And they nurture me so that, and give me like a place in a home to be so I can blossom. I think he's going to be a poet. But anyway, you get the idea. So um, what I'm going to do now is sort of put up uh, what I think the ingredients of a good purpose are. And of course, I'm saying good. I think belonging is quite, quite good. You may think it's rubbish. But uh, anyway, bear with me. So um, the first thing is, it must be grounded in a universally experienced truth. So that it is authentic and authentically yours. One of the problems, actually, of putting a bunch of executives in an offsite and telling them to come up with the purpose of the organization is they won't come up with something that's true. They'll come up with something that's incredibly aspirational to the point where you go, oh, come off it. You know, that's not, you can never do that. Don't get, don't get above yourselves. So I really, really believe you need to have a purpose for an organization that is true. People go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, belong anywhere. It makes me feel like I'm at home wherever I go, even if it's a strange, you know, odd place. And the other thing is, if it's true, it will be yours. It will be differentiated. It won't be like anyone else's because it's unique to you. It's, your, it's what you've done. It's your experience. So that's number one. And I think most purposes you see around in most organizations, especially for banks and so on, they always have like the same four things. We, our purpose is to give money to shareholders. Yay. Um, is to deliver, make the best products. Blah. Um, is to give back to our local community. Oh, yeah, because they hate you. And um, to be, you know, ecological or whatever. It's always the same four things. Totally undifferentiated and often not true. That being said, the, next, the other thing it needs to be also, it needs to be grounded in truth, but it needs to stretch to the stars. It needs to be so exciting that it's what you want to get out of bed for in the morning to do. And, and often it'll, it'll seem impossible. You know, creating a world where anyone can belong anywhere seems impossible. The truth is, it's not. It's just improbable. So the reason why I put um, the equality uh, campaign symbol up there is because you know, I was living this in, uh, in uh, New York about eight, nine years ago. The idea of marriage equality for gays in the US seemed ridiculous, impossible, in fact. And now, within three or four years, we were wrong. It wasn't impossible, it was just improbable, and now it is actually true. It can be done. Likewise, with um, All Out, we stand for equality everywhere. For everyone, it used to be, which was better. Equality everywhere for everyone. And there's uh, 76 countries in the world where it's illegal to be gay and 11 where you can be executed for being gay um, or have life imprisonment. And the goal of Airbnb is to reduce that down to zero, zero, from 76.10 to zero, zero. Seems impossible. It's not impossible. It's just improbable. But it's an exciting, real challenge you want to get up for in the morning and do. So that's the second thing. Now, the third thing is it should be about one big thing. As I said just before, people often cram four or five different things in their purpose. It needs to be about one thing because it needs to be specific. Remember, this is the thing that guides the ship. It needs to help you make the decision to say, we will launch this product, but not that. We'll buy that company, but not this. Um, so it needs to be very specific. It's the criteria for everything you do. But it also needs to be big enough and broad enough to anticipate what you might be doing in 100 years after you're dead, all right? I mean, this purpose is last for, should last in an organization forever. So who knows, Airbnb may not be offering homes and experiences and things um, in the future. It might be something else. But it damn well has to be about creating a world uh, where anyone can belong anywhere. So the reason I'm showing you this, this is Brian uh, who, getting up on stage and launching TRIPS, the idea of TRIPS two years ago, which is we want to bring belong anywhere mission to life, not just through homes, but through the whole experience, the whole trip you're ever likely to take. And the first 
or the second step in, my, uh, in that journey is a product we launched two years ago called Experiences. Hopefully some of you have done this, where you can be a host, but just not, not of a home, if you don't have a home to be a host in. But if you're passionate about surfing and you want to teach um, uh, uh, guests, visitors, uh, how to surf or golf or wine or whatever it is, you can set up an experience and run it, as you can see here. Uh, that was a direct output of Belong Anywhere. It was extending the idea of feeling like a local and being integrated into the local environment, meeting locals, but in a, in a different way. And now this is a huge success, actually. Within two years, it's already made, making a profit. <coughs> the full thing is you need to declare it and own it so that you're held accountable to it. Now, a lot of... If you don't do this, by the way, it'll just end up as something, you know, printed on a mug or a T-shirt or on a PowerPoint somewhere. Um, you need to be out there so that you're held accountable to it. That means people are going to, you know, criticize you if you don't do it. Good. You need to be held accountable. You have to deliver it. Um, this is a, a, a video we produced a year or so ago um, that kind of brings that alive. Don't go to Paris. Don't tour Paris. And please don't do Paris. Live in Paris. When you Airbnb in Paris, you have your own home. Make your bed. Cook. You know, the stuff you normally do. Don't go to LA. Don't go to New York. Don't go to Tokyo. Live there. Live in Malibu. Live in the East Village. Live in Shinagawa. Feel at home. Anywhere. Do your regular routine. Wherever you go, don't go there. Live there. Even if it's just for a night. Fifthly, last thing, it must be lived, or horrible word, but operationalized. Um, otherwise, it will never be delivered. Now, of course, this is by far the most important yet hardest thing to do. And I'm, if we've got time, yes, we have exactly enough time, actually. I'm going to do a quick romp through, um, oh, just a summary. <laughs> Grounded in experience truth, but stretched to the stars, one big thing, so specific enough, but broad enough for you to anticipate the future. Declare and own it, operationalize and live it. So I'm going to just zoom in to operationalize and live it a bit, because... You know, it's hard coming up with a purpose for an organization that fits that criteria, but it's even harder to deliver it. So we've been trying to do that over the past few years at Airbnb, and I thought I would share some of the things that we've been doing, um, warts and all, meaning that you know, it's, there's mistakes we're always making. So here we go. <clears throat> it must come first. These are the things we've learned. It must lead everything. Everything. So I got Brian to say this uh, one Sunday afternoon when I had the three founders together and we were, I was trying to suck out of them what the real core values of the organizer of uh, Airbnb were. And uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but he said this, most important of all, he said mission, obviously mission led. The simplest way to describe it is that mission comes before everything. It comes before personal gain of the people who work at the company. It comes before the valuation. It comes before profits. It comes before business performance. It comes before the experience of working at the company. It comes before all the other values. It theoretically comes before the quality of the product. I mean, I could keep going, right? I don't think I've ever heard the CEO of a company say something like that. And actually, I checked in with him last week to say, are you still okay with me saying this to the public, especially in a year where you know, Wall Street might be looking at Airbnb, you might go public, all that kind of stuff. And he said, yes, totally cool. I really believe it. Um, and he does. So when he said this, and we talked about it a bit, he said, I realize what I need to do is create the right expectations with my board and with my uh, shareholders. I have to tell them that I'm going to tell them when I report on the company's performance, not just about profit and revenue. I'm also going to tell them how well we're doing against our mission of creating a world where anyone can belong anywhere, because it comes first. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not interested in all of those things. Of course not. In fact, Airbnb is already, for the past two years, is just uh, on an IPTA basis, uh, is profitable. Um, we believe that if you follow your mission and deliver it, you will get loads of that stuff. 
all right? But it's too easy one day to say, oh, you know, um, we can get our quarterly targets of number of listings if we work with property managers, property owning companies. Uh, we'll get our quarterly results. That's fine, you're going to get your quarterly roles, results, but they don't deliver the Airbnb experience, so you wouldn't be achieving your mission. And so uh, you need to achieve your mission, and that will yield to the right kinds of profit and so forth. Um, so I'm just showing you some quotes here from uh, some people who work at Airbnb. In the last, in 2015, I'm just explaining how we got to this. 2015, uh, we more than doubled in size. By the way, Airbnb um, has been what's called a hyper, I know you know it's a unicorn, but it's also a hypergrowth unicorn. So we would have growth rates of two to 300% every year, right? Not 10%, not 20 spent. Two, that means we had two to three times as many uh, users, revenue, bookings, uh, and employees every year. Massive, massive hypergrowth. Um, and so that has a huge effect on the culture, which is a big, Airbnb is kind of famous in Silicon Valley for its culture. Uh, and they, their founders, and we all are incredibly proud of it. It's, we protect it beyond anything. But we noticed in 2015, it was getting wobbly because we doubled in size. When I joined Airbnb in, 20, in 2012, there was 150 people in HQ. Um, by 2015, we had 2,000. Um, so that's gonna push you know, and create problems. So I went out to try and find out what the problems were and see how we could fix them. Again, that's another story. But anyway, one of the things I asked them to do was, okay, you give some advice to the founders, since you're passionate about the culture, and I guarantee they'll see it. I asked them to say, I, I asked them to write down what you want them to continue to do, what you want them to stop doing, and what you want them to start doing. And so as you can see here, <clears throat> um, every employee, wanted them also to incorporate, reiterate, values and mission into decision-making, team meetings, internal, external, everything, basically. She leads everything. Continue to focus um, and stay true to the mission. Uh, continue to communicate the vision. Stop avoiding tough topics like vision versus real business. So there, there was a couple of big decisions that were made where people felt that we were favoring short-term growth over long-term mission and purpose, and they were getting upset about it. That was one of the causes of the, the wobbly culture. People were thinking, hey, we're not actually a purpose-driven company after all. I don't have time to talk about it, but I'd love to. Okay, the second big thing is it must be used to recruit, review, and reject everybody, including users. So this is something you have to sign when you uh, join Airbnb as a guest or a host. Our mission, right up there, we tell them what the mission is. Our mission is to build a trusted community where anyone can belong anywhere. To ensure this, we're asking you to accept our terms of service and make a commitment to respect everyone on Airbnb. I agree to treat everyone in the Airbnb community regardless of race, blah, 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 blah. Um, the third thing is that it must be used and be seen to be used by the leaders, because if you don't use it and be seen to be used it, no one else will. Uh, Brian said this in front of that big uh, gathering of employees. Hold me accountable, ultimately. If the founders are the caretakers of the vision and values, then as CEO, I'm res really responsible for executing the values and the vision. So if our vision is to create a world where all seven billion people can belong anywhere, whether we're on that path or not, that's me. So we had a problem, though, in that some of our leaders uh, on the East staff, the leadership team, people felt and, and I, uh, that uh, they weren't leading the vision. So one of the things I did with their culture, because it's such a... You know, what is culture? When you talk, everyone thinks they know what culture is, but when you ask them, they kind of go, oh, it's fun in the workplace, which it isn't. That's like the default definition of culture. Oh, fun in the workplace. It's not that at all. That's like a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of it. So what I ask them to do is imagine a party balloon. Imagine the air in the balloon is the culture. Blow more air into the balloon, and you get more of the culture. But equally, there could be leaks in the balloon, and the culture will leak out. You tell me what's being blown into the balloon, what's contributing to the culture, and what's making the culture leak out. And then whether there's a net uh, increase or decrease in the size of the balloon. So as you can see here, and this is, I picked this as an example because they're all the same. Good people, mission-driven people were contributing to the culture. Our mission contributed to the, camp, to the um, culture. What was 
coming, what was de decreasing it was leaders and e-staff members who just didn't get it, people who don't live the values, especially leaders. So there were two or three actually people out of the, I don't know what they were, like 10 members of e-staff, this is about two or three years ago, who um, were not values led. I should have said a really important thing we do at Airbnb. When you, we, the whole thing about recruit, review and reject, when you come into Airbnb, you will probably get uh, eight or 10 interviews. So let's say eight out of 10 of them are gonna be about your skill. So you'll be interviewed by the marketing department if you're interviewing for a marketing job or, or software engineers if you're gonna be an engineer. Um, and they're assessing your skill, just like any interview. But then you have two core values and mission interviews. And they are undertaken by people who have nothing to do with your discipline. And they're looking to see if there is an overlap between your personal values what drives you and Airbnb's values. And if there isn't an overlap, then you're rejected and they have veto power. So we could, we could get someone in who's the best engineer in Silicon Valley, but they'll be rejected if they don't pass the core values interviews. And we've now put that into the review system uh, in order to, as we said, we don't have high performing assholes. So we have on one column how well you're performing and whether you performed that, you know, you made that impact whilst living the core values. And you need to be in this quartile. If you're not, uh, then you leave. <clears throat> Fourthly, it must lead all the big decisions, especially the risky or existential ones. So I'm picking one of many here. Um, oops, I've got three minutes, okay. Uh, in 2013, we had a, an existential crisis. Um, some of you may remember this, but the Attorney General of New York issued Airbnb a subpoena for all of our hosts' information in New York. That was 15,000 hosts at the time. And we didn't want to do this because we felt that was a massive data overreach. We needed to stand by our hosts, live our values, which is be hosts to our hosts. And uh, we didn't want to do it. The thing is, no one says no to the Attorney General of New York. Uh, what we wanted to do was go back and say, no, we're going to take you to court and squash your subpoena. We think it's, it's, a, it's a fishing expedition. And it will, you know, you're, you're throwing hosts' private information out there into to this guy. So um, they, we, their lawyers actually said to us, and said, do you have any, uh, this was 2013, when no one had really heard of Airbnb, we were this pipsqueak little company. He just got billions out of the international banks for causing the 2008 crisis the week before. He should have got more in my view, but that's what he got. And then we come along and say, nope, we're taking you to court. We want to protect our, our hosts. And his lawyers said, oh, to our one lawyer, we'd have one lawyer, said, do you have lawyers? You know that no one says no to the Attorney General of New York? So this was like a big deal. And this is a, a picture I took at the time in uh, the den, as we called it. There's Brian, there's uh, Belinda, who's now the CEO. That's the feet of the one government relations guy we had at the time, and that's the one lawyer we had at the time. And um, this was this long week of sweaty meetings late at night where we were trying to decide, should we do this? Should we take the Attorney General of New York to court? Because he could kill us. I mean, this could totally finish us off. And we said, at the end of the day, we've got to do it. We've got to live our mission of belong anywhere. We have to stand by our hosts. They're our partners. Um, we have to host them. They need to feel that they belong and that they're in a safe space with us. And so that's what we did. And we did take him to court and we did squash the subpoena. Yabu sucks. So now the fifth thing <coughs> is you need to measure the purpose. This is something Airbnb hasn't nailed yet. I think it's actually, of all the things I just put up here, this is the most important thing. You need to measure how well you're delivering your mission and give it equal status to business metrics. And Because uh, as this guy, this uh, product, the BNB product manager told me, if this is something that's important to the company, then we need to include it in our goals. He said, I'm responsible for increasing um, conversion from, from browsing to book. Okay? I can increase that number really easily by getting the wrong customers in for the wrong reasons. I need a counterweight goal that helps me say, yes, I could do that, but I shouldn't because it's going to not deliver the mission. I need to have that in a set of my goals, otherwise it's not fair to me. Um, so what Airbnb is doing actually is testing all kinds of questions and ways of measuring this so that it can be done, but it hasn't been nailed yet. It's quite hard. Uh, last couple of things. You need values. This is a huge subject. Could talk about this for an hour on its own. They're the how that delivers the why. They govern how you behave and decide and relate to deliver the mission. This is a picture of Berlin's uh, office, which I'm happy to say has a bar in the entrance. 
as you might expect from the Germans, and there's belong anywhere. And then there's the book of our core values, six at the time. Those, those were they. Um, the values need to be used, be seen to be used by leaders for everything. If they don't, no one else will. And you can see this here. Advice to founders, make values to continue to make values-driven decisions and holding others accountable. Start holding other executives and leaders accountable when they fail to operate with a values-driven mindset. This is when these, these three leaders on the East staff, they felt, they're basically saying, why are they there? They don't belong and they're undermining. I mean, if, they, if the leadership is not living the values, it totally devalues the values and turns people into cynical, bitter people uh, about it all, uh, which, is, which is toxic. And make sure they're real and core. So the very last thing I did when I was there is get us down from six to four. I think we should have got to three, personally. But I asked people, what are the ideal characteristics of any core values for any organization? And this person, they're more or less the same, said, clarity, fewer them, aspiration, unreal, not marketing. From top down, you hold values dear. Uh, or you shouldn't be here. And then I said, OK, now mark what our values are against your ideal. And you can see we didn't do very well. So I went, after doing this exercise, back to uh, Brian, Joe, and Nate, the three founders, and said, we have to change the thing that should never be changed. We have to change the values that you guys came up with in 2012 because they're not real. And they're contributing to this wobbly culture that we're having in the moment because people aren't taking them seriously because they're not real. They're not clear, and um, there's too few of them. And they said, yeah, OK, let's do it. You know, I held hands and said, OK, we've got to do this. It's insane, but let's do it. And one of the ways we got to values that were real was this technique. Again, any of you interested in culture? What I got people to do that I interviewed, over 300 people in the company, I said, draw a Venn diagram. One circle is you. Write down the values that you stand for as a person, Who, the values that define you. Now do the same for Airbnb, and you decide how much they overlap. And of course, put in the middle the ones that you share. And um, so actually what happened, which was really good to see, is people would redraw it because they realized there was a lot of overlap. And it was all about the same things like mission-driven, um, passionate, proud, collaborate, community-focused, and all those kinds of things. So I took those 300 sheets. I noted down every single word in the middle, clustered them when they were similar, and saw which ones were the most important and came back to the founders and said, we have to dump two of them, because they're not real. This one we had here called Simplify, um, we were terrible at that. No one believed it, so we've now dumped it as a core value. Likewise, Every Frame Matters, which is about you know, the detail, we dumped that. But we said that we were championing the mission, being a host, being a serial entrepreneur, this one I'm not so sure about, um, were real. I'd love to talk to you more about that, so it's kind of a fascinating exercise. What, the big thing I'm trying to say about this is, don't have aspirational values. Because if you have something you aspire to do but can't actually ever deliver, you'll create a very cynical, bitter organization. Have values which truly reflect who you are at your best. When you're performing at your best, find out what those are and live those. Final point, someone mentioned it this morning actually, is uh, <clears throat> with the founders I said, we need to do this, we need an inside out strategy. We will never deliver belong anywhere and our values externally, authentically, if we don't deliver it internally first. We need to create an environment where employees feel like they belong here. And uh, some don't. And we need to fix that. Um, and we need to get the right values and so on, and then roll it out. What we're now doing, I just spoke with a guy last night who's on product for Plus, you know, this new Plus curated uh, homes, is we're now taking our values that we used to hire you know, to, you know, um, recruit, reject, et cetera, employees, we're now going to start applying it to hosts, five million hosts. <laughs> we're going to start applying, applying those to, the, to the, our users, too. Whew. OK, that's it. Um, these are the things. It must come first. It's used to recruit and re reject everyone. Used by leaders, visibly. Used for big decisions. It's measured, given equal status to business metrics. Have core values, they or how. Make them few and real and used by the leaders. Operationalize, live the values from the inside out. Thank you very much.